My name is Alan Jay, National Executive Director at ZOA. Welcome to everybody with a special welcome to our friends that are joining us from Israel. We hope that all on this call are and remain safe and healthy. And please know that the brave soldiers in the IDF and all defenders of the Jewish state of Israel and of the Jewish people across the globe are always in our prayers. Today, we are hosting a special guest, Hillel Fool, who will appropriately speak about, if not now, when, from Tech to Israel Advocacy. Before we officially introduce our speaker, I hope you're all visiting our website often, www.zoa.org. I hope you're receiving our ZOA news releases and action alerts that keep you up to date on ZOA activity. And please keep in mind that all ZOA webinars are posted to our ZOA YouTube channel, and you can log on, and these are great ways for you to keep up with the work that we're doing here at ZOA. My colleague, Jackie Schaefer, will post a link in the chat during the webinar so that you know how to access those. All microphones will remain muted for the duration of the program. After Hillel's presentation, ZOA senior fellow Akiba Kovitz will moderate Q&A. If you have a question for our guest, please post it in the Zoom Q&A feature. We will not be monitoring questions in the chat, so please use the Q&A feature. I can tell you that ZOA National President Mort Klein keeps a schedule that would challenge most of us. One of, if not the most prominent Zionists of our time, Mort is eternally busy promoting Israel's sovereignty, prioritizing Israel's safety, supporting Israel's right and obligation to complete the mission to destroy Hamas, and warning the world <laughs> of the insanity and the danger inherent in a mythical two-state solution. Given his crazy schedule, we're fortunate that Mort has the time to join us today. So with no further ado, here is ZOA National President Mort Klein to introduce our speaker, Mort. Well, thank you, Alan. <clears throat> thank you, Akiva. And thank you everyone for being with us for this very important session which, in which all of us will learn uh, quite a bit. ZOA is a is the oldest and the greatest Zionist organization in America. <laughs> uh, so it is a special privilege for us to uh, host and bring to you uh, Hillel Fold, who is a great Zionist from a great Zionist family. He was born in New York. His father, Rabbi Yonah Fold, was the principal of uh, an important Hebrew day school, Yeshiva. Salanter Akiba Riverdale Academy. <laughs> <clears throat> Hillefold is one of the truly great advocates for Eretz Yisrael around the world. He has a tremendous following. He advocates for a strong and proud, unapologetic, unappeasing Eretz Yisrael, fighting the propaganda lies uh, that are with us uh, every day, every month throughout the year. <laughs> He's an international speaker. He's a high-tech uh, uh, journalist, high-tech professional. Uh, he's worked for, for Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Intel, many, many others. And uh, he's not the only great Zionist in his family besides his father and others. Uh, he also lost, it's a tragic loss to all of us, his very dear and extraordinary brother, Ari Fold, who was tragically murdered by a vicious, despicable, sinister, evil monster. Arab Islamic terrorist <laughs> and this terrorist for killing this fabulous human being will receive a lifetime pension or his family will from Mahmoud Abbas. They spend $400 million a year paying lifetime pensions to people who murder Jews. And I have to say this evil monster, Mahmoud Abbas is now being promoted by our own secretary of state, Anthony Blinken, by other Jewish leaders, uh, such as Dennis Ross and the uh, AJ Committee and ADL, he's being promoted that he, Abbas, should be the head of, an, of a uh, new Palestinian state that they want to establish. What could be more disgraceful than that, to have a killer of Jews, to be promoted by Jews, to be the head of an expanded state, which would only endanger Israel much, much more. We hope and pray to God that uh, this uh, notion is stopped and stopped in its tracks. <laughs> So without further ado, I'm honored to present to you one of the great fighters for, the, for Eretz Yisrael, one of the great fighters for the Jewish people. And I'm so grateful uh, he's with us, fighting for us. We need him so badly today. I give you Hillel Fold. Thank you so much for that incredible introduction. Um, your, your PR check is in the mail, I'm telling you. I'm just like, 
amazing. Uh, but it also it also made me feel very comfortable that that we can clearly take off the gloves and be honest with each other here, which I love. Um, so I'll just give a little background on myself uh, for those that aren't familiar, and I'll tell you kind of what was uh, pre October seventh Hillel Fold, and then what is post October seventh Hillel Fold. So I, uh, I I was born and raised in Queens, New York. My father, uh, as mentioned, was the principal of SAR. He was he is quite a, a visionary in the world of Jewish education. Uh, he was invited to the White House, top three schools in America. He's quite a legend, my dad. Um, my mom is too. She's also in education. And so, uh, you know, I came here when I was 15, middle of high school, moved to Israel from, you know, I went to uh, high school in uh, in MTA, YU, and then I came to Yerushalayim. It was quite a transition, as you can imagine. 15 is not an easy age by any means to come to, uh, to, come to Israel. But I can tell you now, 30 years later, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. On a personal level, um, I live in Beit Shemesh with uh, my wife and five beautiful kids, my Youngest are twins. They're 12 and a half. They'll be bar mitzvah in about a month. So that's very exciting. Um, and uh, really, you know, as many of you know, 30 years ago when I moved here to be, to move to Israel, to make Aliyah, you really had to be a hardcore Zionist, right? Because 30 years ago, Israel wasn't the country that it is today. Let's just say that. Uh, you know, as you might remember, it was basically you couldn't get deodorant here or tuna fish. It was really, uh, I don't want to say third world country, but it was not easy. Uh, but today, I can tell you, and I'm sure many of you know this. I, you know, I wake up every morning and I pinch myself, like, how is this my life? This is this is paradise here. And I'm, of course, going to discuss October seventh. But you know, the life in Israel, in my opinion, is no less. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't, I don't feel like I'm making any uh, compromise in quality of life in Israel, which to me, um, you know, just adds to the amazing fact that we can live in the state of Israel. Um, so I live in Beit Shemesh, as mentioned, and. Um, you know, really just feel very, very blessed every day. On a professional side, um, I've always been a very, uh, I would say, enthusiastic, uh, um, you know, passionate person when it comes to technology specifically. And, you know, I really remember the first day, the first time I ever turned on a computer. Uh, and when I came to Israel, uh, you know, I didn't really know my, my avenue into tech because I'm not an engineer, but I knew that was my northern star. I knew I was getting there at some point somehow. Anyway, I finished a degree in political science and then I found myself kind of, what, what do I do next? And so uh, many people said to me, you know, you love technology, you love writing, go be a technical writer. I didn't know what that was, but it sounded great. And I took a course in technical writing only to find out it's the guys who write the user guides you get with your iPhone that no one ever reads. So that was my first job, writing user guides for AT&T and Verizon. As you can imagine, not an optimal career choice for someone with ADHD like myself. Um, and so one day I'm sitting at my desk about 17, 18 years ago, and I just said, this is, this is ridiculous. And I said, I said to myself, you know, I, I love tech. I'm going to start writing on the internet about technology. Uh, today, we call that a blog. That was not a, a word back then. It definitely wasn't. A, there was no business model, uh, you know, of, of blogging on the internet. But I, I had this deep passion for technology. So I, I really ignored all the business advice that I was receiving from everyone. Uh, and I just said, listen, leave me alone. This is a passion thing. And I'm going to continue doing it. And what ended up happening is that uh, entrepreneurs started to reach out to me. I would meet with, uh, you know, tech CEOs in Israel and just try to help as much as I can. And I quickly understood that, uh, as a general kind of generalization, um, Israeli entrepreneurs are fantastic at building technology, but they're equally bad at building businesses. Uh, and so I would, uh, I would just try to help, really. And um, it wasn't a business in the beginning, but turns out when you help others win, you end up winning. And so many, many entrepreneurs start to pour into my inbox and say, you know, you helped us early on, let's work together. So for the past 10 years, um, I've built this consulting business uh, with, you know, I work with companies from small startups in a garage to, as mentioned, to Google and Oracle and Microsoft, all kind of different, uh, you know, different names, but it's all basically the same stuff. All of these large, you know, multinational Fortune 100 companies have this, this influencer program. Uh, Google calls it Google Developer Experts and Microsoft calls it Brand Ambassadors. It's all, all the same stuff. But, um, you know, I really was very fortunate to really live my dream, both personally and professionally. I, I you know... I, uh, I got to meet the most unbelievable and remarkable people every single day. And I really felt like I was a kid in a candy store every day of my life. And, um, and you know, I had a great time. So October 7th, I'm in, uh, I'm in Shul, I'm in synagogue here in Beit Shemesh. And, um, you know, we're without our phones. And um, on, the way to, on the way to Shul with my twins, I was walking to, to Shul and I heard, you know, rockets above or, or iron domes above. And as sad as this is to say, it, it kind of became like a normal routine. Okay, yeah, okay, they're shooting rockets at us. And it, it really didn't phase us too much. Uh, we got to shul, and sure enough, the first siren, and then the second siren, and we knew something was up, but we didn't, you know, we didn't know obviously the extent of it. But then, when people started to get called up, the kids and you know, eighteen-year-old kids in, in the shul and the, the community started to get called up, we knew something was up. Um, but again, our minds could not even, you know, go that far. In fact, 
people were telling me, um, as someone who who lost, you know, a, a brother to terror, um, and who's always triggered by terror, that I, you know, calm down. They said to me, it's okay, like it will be okay. Don't worry. And I was like, and I was really, and I said for some reason, I don't know where I got this number from or why my brain went here, but I said to people, how could I calm down? What happens if I come back and I turn on my phone and there are 75 casualties? And I don't know where I got that number from, 75, but that was like the farthest my brain could fathom. Like I couldn't even imagine anything worse than that. I I don't know why, but so, you know, I turned on my phone and the rest is history. Um, And pretty immediately without thinking too much or talking to anyone, I, I, I quickly realized, you know, everything I've done has brought me to this moment and I need to now shut down my business and I need to focus on Israel. And so from basically October 8th, I've been channeling Ari, my, my little brother, uh, fighting, you know, basically 24 hours a day uh, online with a very specific mission. My mission is twofold. One is to fight misinformation in a way that I provide real-time accurate information. I just want to talk about that for one second, because those two things, real-time and accurate, are generally mutually exclusive. If I'm providing real-time information, then I don't have any way to verify it, and I'm going to make mistakes. And if I'm pro- providing accurate information, it's going to take time to verify. It won't be real time. Uh, but because I work closely with many different channels from the IDF, spokesman, you know, spokesperson's office and the government and many different channels, I'm kind of cross-referencing. And so I'm being very, very careful with what I post. In fact, today I did make an error um, because there was a lot of rumors about a new list of, of hostages and many, many people on social media were talking about, you know, the, the, the baby uh, that, you know, we all are praying for. And, and it said that he was on the, on the list and, you know, it was just too many sources. So I made a mistake. And I didn't say, you know, that he was killed because I didn't have that information. But I did say, you know, this is a terrible day or something. And I alluded to the fact. And quickly, I understood that this is actually not confirmed. So I, I deleted the post, which is something that I don't often do. But this was obviously a very sensitive situation. So I'm very, very focused on real time and accurate. And I'll just give you a, a case study of, of why why that's important. You know, the, the the famous now famous story of the hospital, right? We all remember that, that hospital story. So about a half an hour before it was uh, on the news, I received the information from the IDF and I was told by the IDF, this was not us. And I knew about it, let's say about a half an hour before. And so I posted on X on Twitter and I said, heads up, you're going to be hearing about a hospital bombing and you're going to be told it was Israel. And I'm telling you it is not Israel. Now, you have to understand for the past 15 years, I've been building out my, my platform, my social networks. And, you know, my audience is primarily tech people, which is primarily liberal people. Uh, But because I've built that trust over the years, I'm kind of now capitalizing on that and using that kind of relationship to spread truth. And so that post where I said that it wasn't Israel got about two plus million impressions. And so when the propaganda machine kicked in about a half an hour later and everyone was being told it was Israel, we had millions of people here who knew that it wasn't Israel. Uh, So that's kind of a case study of why it's important. And, you know, we all know the amount of misinformation and Uh, The way I see it, I kind of split the internet up into three groups. First group is us, our group, right? We don't need convincing, but we do need reinforcement. We do need strengthening. We do need information. We do need the ability to answer questions. So that's our group. The other side of the spectrum is the the third group, which I call the Heil Hitler people, right? The guys who are sending me pictures of my dead brother with fire coming out of him and, you know, gas the Jews, those, those people. Those people I've written off, right? They're... You know, I can't get I can't get through to them. If you're if you're going to say those things, there's nothing to talk about. With the small asterisk that there has been, I don't know. Let's say the whole between from from the beginning of the war, maybe I'd say 20 people who have reached out and said to me, "You don't understand. I was super duper anti-Israel, and and I've just been following and I've been reading your tweets and I've done some research, and it turns out, you know, I was actually dead wrong. So, but those are the exceptions. The middle group, which according to my let's call it anecdotal data. Uh, is the vast majority. And that is people that are not necessarily pro-Israel, but they have they have integrity. They're willing to hear, they're willing to talk, they're willing to listen, they're willing to admit that they're wrong if they're wrong. And, you know, those are the people that I'm primarily targeting. And I've gotten, I don't know, thousands of messages from people saying, you know, I simply did not know what Zionism was until I read your tweet. So just to give you context, um, my, my posts across social networks from the beginning of the war till now I've surpassed a half a billion. So f- around 550, 600 million impressions, um, you know, across all networks with X, Twitter being the biggest by far. Um, you know, I think I'm at, I don't know, 400 million on Twitter and 200 in the rest of the platforms. Uh, but, you know, it's it's a it's an endless battle, as you all know. Um, you know, I'm dealing with people who, you know, it, it's one thing if you're going to, you know, twist the truth or tell a white lie. 
Uh, it's another thing where you're going to make things up out of the blue with absolutely no basis, like literally. And we all we've seen it all, you know, the harvesting of the organs and just crazy things, right? We're b- based on nothing, you know. Uh, and so it's very, it's very tiring, and it's it's. I'm in the mud all day long. I'm in the mud, um, but it also it is very rewarding. Uh, so back to my mission. That's the first part of my mission, uh, you know, real time accurate information. The second part of my mission um, is let's call it providing hope, right? For lack of a better term, I mean, it's providing optimism. It's giving our camp a reason to wake up in the morning because we're all devastated. We're all in deep mourning. Uh, I think that's true for you know anybody who, who who's civilized and has a conscience cannot possibly be sleeping well at night after everything that we've endured. Um, and so, you know, any piece of good news that we can get really is makes a huge difference. And so whether it's, you know, taking out Hamas leaders, uh, whether it's um, an inspirational video or, you know, a nice uh, reunion of a, of a father and, a, you know, we've seen all these videos, but I'm, I'm very, very systematic in sharing those things. It's extremely important. And I can tell you that I'm getting messages from people saying I could not get out of, out of bed in the morning until I, you know, you've helped me. And, and it is very rewarding. I just got a message literally as I was heading downstairs for this uh, webinar from a, a soldier. I'll read it to you. It's a beautiful message. A soldier in Sayer at Nachal. So it's the uh, elite unit of Nachal. And he, I don't even know the guy. He writes me on LinkedIn and he says to me, just want to say thank you for giving me hope and keeping my mind from going crazy. My whole unit loves you. I said, what unit? And he said, Palsar Nachal, August 2019. I said, what do you mean they love me? What am I missing here? He said, I share your stuff sometimes with my army unit. They are in Miluin. They love your posts when I share with them. You give all us, all of us a lot of chizuk. And you know, it's this is something that just generally, you know, when you write, when you're on a keyboard and you're writing on the internet, you can you can see the number of impressions, but you don't put a face to them, right? And so I know how many people are reading my tweets, but you know, again, it's it's hard to understand on a personal level how this is impacting people. And so when I get messages like that, it's like this is all worth it. But you know, there are days, and today was one of those days with all those rumors, um, where it's just like I I can't, you know, I, I these people, I, like it's just too much devastation. I try very hard. I try very hard to avoid bringing people down with my posts, but, you know, there's no avoiding it sometimes. Now, I think, you know, I think I have a, probably a very different perspective on what's going on here than than most of you. And I want to give a disclaimer before I say it. About two weeks ago, I was called uh, by a friend who who accompanied a, a group, a delegation of Harvard alums to Israel. And he asked me to speak to the group. And I didn't have any context on the group. I didn't know their opinions. I, you know, I, didn't, I just literally had like 10, 15 minutes of a spontaneous talk to Harvard alums. And I got up there and I told them what I'm about to tell you. Um, and some of the group who were clearly very, very, I don't i don't know what word to use. I don't want to use the word self-hating, but very anti anything to do with Judaism as a religion of any kind uh, really viciously attacked me. Like I've never been attacked like that before. So what I'm about to say, you know, is somewhat controversial, but it's important. It's an important perspective. And I think I think if you step back and look at it, which is hard to do, you'll realize the truth here. And that is that throughout our history, you know, we've endured, everyone knows how much persecution we've endured. I don't have to tell you. But I think that when we celebrate Purim, for example, right? And and I think Purim is one of the happiest days of the Jewish calendar. We're all, you know, alcohol and getting dressed up and, and parties. We love Purim. But if I was living in the time of Purim and you told me that one day we would celebrate Purim, I would probably stop talking to you. I'd say to you, that is the most insensitive thing. What do you mean? It was the near genocide of the Jewish people. How could you say we're going to celebrate? Are you nuts? And Hanukkah, we were winning that war. There was no way we were winning that war. We were, we were done, right? And here we are. But even Pesach, right? We, we talk about Passover. It's like, you know, oh, the 10 plagues. Listen, you know, I'm, I'm a very, uh, you know, proud Jew, but I'm going to say something. And that is that we are... We don't learn from our mistakes. We really, really don't learn from our mistakes. And I don't know if you're familiar with this commentary on the Torah, but Rashi says that when the Jews left Egypt, 80% of the Jews stayed back. 80%. 20% of the Jews left Egypt. And again, it's not written in the Torah, so you could say it's not, you know, but Rashi says it. Why am I mentioning that? Because how could it be that after the 10 plagues and after everything that happened in Egypt, 80% stayed? How could that be? And the answer is we don't often see what's right in front of our face. We don't. And then we went to the desert and we had miracle after miracle after miracle. And just this week's Torah portion, this literally this week's Torah portion, we get out of the the sea, split for us. We walk out of the sea and we say, yeah, but you know what? The Egyptians are coming right behind us. And God's like, dude, like I'm taking care of you. Like the Egyptians are gone. They're like, no, we don't, we don't believe it. And God had to literally, we say this in our prayers every morning. 
that says, Vayar Yisrael, the Israelites saw Mitzrayim al Sfatayah, they saw the dead bodies, and only then do they believe. It's like, are you serious? I mean, how could you? So we don't see what's right in front of our eyes. And I'm going to say again with a disclaimer, what I'm about to say, you know, is not to belittle or diminish or, you know, what we've endured has been absolutely tragic and, and of historic proportions, and there's no belittling that. That being said, we have to step back and we have to look at this from a historic perspective. And, you know, a four-month war with 250 casualties, I mean, think about that. Really, and every every life that's lost is a, is a world. And I, you don't have to tell me about loss. I know what it is. But we have to step back. You know, and it, again, I, this, this lady from Harvard really got upset with what I'm about to say. So I'm going to give a disclaimer, and I hope this doesn't offend anyone, but it, 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 it keeps me going. And that is that, you know, that day, that horrible, horrible day, if I told you that 3,000 3, terrorists walk into a country smaller than New Jersey with eight and a half hours of free hand, which is obviously a discussion and a topic that needs to be analyzed for decades, but they have eight and a half hours of free hand and unlimited access to automatic weapons. How many people would you expect them to have murdered? Think about it. And every one of those 1,200 people is a world and it's a tragedy of unbelievable proportions. But we have to think about it. You would expect, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000, maybe 150,000, eight hours, unlimited access to automatic weapons, a tiny little country. They, their plans were go to Tel Aviv. We, we saw the plans. So how could it be, and again, these are horrible words, that only, only 12, how could that be? The answer is, they're atrocities. Had they not done what they did, I don't want to think what would have happened. Half of this will be wiped out. So I would never use the word miracle about that horrible day, because that's just, that's inappropriate. But there is something to look and say, my God, had they not done those things, what would have happened? But you know what? Forget October 7th. Every single time a rocket lands in an empty space, we all just accept it. Oh, yeah, a rocket landed in empty space. I mean, you've been in Israel. Where are these empty spaces? Where are these empty spaces? It's like, what is going on here? Where are they landing? You know, but even, even the Iron Dome. I, I sat with Dr. Daniel Gold, who invented the Iron Dome, and he told me the story. He said he got together the A-team. He brought the smartest people in the country to sit down and figure out how they're going to stop these rockets from raining down on Israel. And they all came up with solutions and he just, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. I want to detonate the rockets midair. And they're like, you want to what now? He says, I want to de detonate the rockets midair. They're like, you can't do that. That's not, pot that's, not a, that's not a thing. You can't do that. He said, well, I want to do it. And he went to the military, the Israeli army, and he said, this is what I want to build. And they said, it's impossible. So he went to the Israeli government. He said, this is what I want to build. And they told him it's impossible. So he went to the U.S. government. Impossible. The U.S. military. Impossible. And he built it. And here we are with a, a system that detonates rocket at 95% precision. Who ever heard of such a thing? So, you know, I, it's true. I am an observant Jew and I try to see God in things. But forget, it, it's not even about God. These are unbelievable miracles happening to us on a daily basis. In the desert, it was the, you know, the, the clouds of glory that protected the Israelites. That's the Iron Dome. It's clouds of glory above us. It, it, it's, there's nothing about this that is natural. But, you know, let's go even deeper, right? You know, we talk about all the hate. We talk about, you know, on October 8th, I don't know about you, but I'm an optimistic guy. And I told myself the silver lining here is at least the world will stand with us because there's no scenario. There is no scenario in which, you know, atrocities that were live streamed in HD footage are going to be denied. That's not, a, there's no scenario. It's impossible. The world will definitely stand by us. And here we are. That doesn't make any sense, you know? And so we could look at it and we could definitely say, you know, it's anti-Semitism. And I'm not dismissing that. Of course there's anti-Semitism. But nothing about this war from beginning to end makes any sense. None of it. How could it be that otherwise intelligent people, otherwise moral people, are literally, literally endorsing rape? I mean, queers for Palestine? Are you kidding me right now, right? So nothing, this war is just one big question mark. So again, for me, I see God. And this woman, this alum from Harvard, she's like, how could you say that? This is a colossal, you know, failure of the Jewish state and the Jewish army, and there's no God here. I wasn't going to argue with her. And, and I'm sure that, you know, some people don't see God, and that's fine. And, I, and I'm not saying, because then the question is, well, why did God, I'm, I'm not going there, right? But all I can say is that this is bigger than us. It is bigger than us. And anybody who doesn't see that is not paying attention. And I have to tell you, a couple of days before the war, and you could see this on social media. That's the beauty. It's still there. I wrote a post and I said, I don't know what's about to happen, 
but something big is about to happen between Russia and Ukraine, America and Iran, America and China, internal politics in Israel, internal politics in America. There's too many things that are just boiling over. Something big is about to happen. And I wrote in the post, Israel will be at the center of it. I literally wrote that. I'm not a prophet, but you know, if you're paying attention to the geopolitical situation, it was clear that something was about to happen. And it's clear that this war is not just another war. This is this is big, way bigger than us, way bigger than me and you, way bigger than Israel, right? I don't want to, you know, throw out words like World War III. I, it's not, that's not what I'm talking about. But we have to understand that this is the definition of a clash of civilizations. This is not about Israel and Hamas or Israel and the Palestinians or Jews and Arabs. It's not what it's about. This is a clash of civilizations. And we're seeing it across the world. It's radical Islam against the West. There's, there's no other way to look at this. And anybody who doesn't see that is part of the problem, right? And anybody who thinks that Hamas wants to stop at Israel is really you know, naive at best and really dumb at worst, or maybe even a, you know, anti-Semite even worse, right? But the reality is we have to look back and look, take a step back and look at what's going on in this war and realize this is bigger than us. And, you know, for me, what, what, what kind of, I'd say, comforts me on a daily basis when I have those moments, and I have those moments all the time where it's like, I just can't anymore. Because again, I'm in the mud, I'm deep in the mud, and I, I see the worst of the worst. So I say to myself, I, you know, I have that moment, I say, I can't anymore. And then I say to myself, listen, Stop looking at this war through a human lens. Stop looking at this war through, because if you look at this war through a human lens, none of it makes sense. From October 7th till now, none of it makes sense. None of it. So I say to myself, I can't, I need to look at this through a different lens. For me, it's God. It could be anything, but it's not natural. This war is not natural. And this is going to be, in my opinion, another massive kind of, I don't want to say the word milestone, but moment in Jewish history that to me, it is clear beyond any shadow of a doubt that just like we dance and sing on Purim, and just like we dance and sing on Hanukkah and on Pesach and all of our holidays, and we have that joke, they tried to kill us, we won, we eat, right? We all know that joke. But the reality is that's the story of the Jewish people. And I'm telling you now, beyond any shadow of a doubt, if, if I've ever been sure about anything in my life, I'm sure about this. We will dance again. Simchas Torah will again be the happiest day of the year. We will hug our Torah scrolls and we will dance again. We will defeat Hamas, and what was will no longer be. The, 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 the reality of having these savage enemies on our border, don't ask me why we thought that was normal in the first place, but that's not for now, right? I mean, what kind of border doesn't have a buffer, but whatever. The reality is what was will no longer be. Hamas will be defeated. Their leadership will be gone. And yes, we have to figure out how to denazify the Palestinian people with UNRWA and everything that's going on. It's complicated. There's no question. But we have to remember, and this is this is this is the, the crux of it, right? People say, oh, you know, you're creating the next generation. How come no one said that in Nazi Germany? Right? So enough with the hypocrisy, right? Enough with the double. It's so blatant and so obvious. Just open a history book. We know the script, right? We know what's gonna happen. It's painful. And there's no belittling that. It's painful. But the reality is we will dance again. Thank you. Thank you, Hillel. Uh I'm going to give Mort the the first question. Uh, lots to follow up on after that, including some questions mm -hmm. from the audience. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> Hillel, wow! I I now regret that we're not paying you to uh, be with us because that was so great. It makes me feel guilty that we're not paying you, but we appreciate the contribution. You're paying me with your you heroism right. for the state of Israel and for the Jewish people. It's enough payment. <laughs> By the way, I want to say that there's a phrase you can use based on some of the things you said by Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill said, you must look at the facts, but the facts are looking at, at you. In other words, even if you're not looking at what's true, what's happening, it's happening, and it's going to affect us. And the Jews, as you mentioned too frequently, have really ignored the facts. You know, we ignored the fact that uh, Arafat was a lifetime terrorist, that he didn't change the covenant, that he didn't arrest terrorists. Uh, that Ab Abbas pays Arabs to murder Jews, and you have Blinken, a Jew whose father was a, fam a famous Holocaust survivor, saying we want Abbas to run this state. And he's not alone in saying it. He's not alone in saying it. <laughs> Dennis Ross is saying we want Abbas to run the state, as is ADL, as is AJ Committee. Even APAC continues to promote uh, a Palestinian state. So, uh, what was my question? 
You say this is a war, a clash of civilizations, a war of uh, Islam, which is radical in and of itself against the West. If that's the case, why is the West not realizing this? Why is France and Germany and England supporting a Palestinian state and siding with the Arabs? Why is America screaming for a state and wanting Israel to stop the war? So you say this is really a, a, a beyond a, a Arab Israel. It's the Islamic world against the West. Yet I don't see the West uh, seeing what you just said. Why do you think they're ignoring this reality that you just espoused? Okay, so I'll give you a I'll give you a Jewish answer and I'll give you a rational answer. Okay, uh, we know anti-Semitism is built into the DNA, DNA of our world. And, you know, many people talk about the fact that in Jewish scripture, we say it's a, it's a known thing that Esau, Esau hates Jacob. That's, that's what it says. And so, you know, everyone focuses on the second part of that sentence, but no one focuses on the first part of that sentence, that it's a known thing. In Hebrew, it says, halacha biyadua. We know it's a known thing. So why, why does it say that? And the answer is, there's no logic. Anti-Semitism is built into the fabric of of the world, and it's always been here and it will always be here. There is no logic. And so when you have such deep hatred, you're blinded. You don't see reality. And so, again, the same script over and over again. So that, that's the Jewish answer, but on a more rational level, because I'm, I'm a logical person, I don't, it's hard for me to accept that. Like, I need some explanation. And I've struggled with this my whole life, which is, why do they hate us? Why? We've only done good for the world. Why do they hate us? And I heard something recently that resonated for me, and it's, it's a slightly controversial thing, and I don't know that I would say it publicly, but I'm saying it here among friends, which is that you look at history, it's, it's the same script over and over again. What happens? There's an empire. There's the Egyptian empire, the Roman empire, the Greek empire, the Nazi empire, the American empire, right? There's an empire, and it's growing and growing and growing. And when it reaches kind of peak influence, and it has complete world dominance, morality goes out the window, right? You have you know an emperor putting people to fight to their death. You have... The, the lack of complete moral clarity, you know, in, in society, which manifests in a million different ways. We're not going to go into it now, but, you know, I think many of you can, 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 can think of things in American society that are counter, not only counterintuitive, but immoral. We just accept them because that's what happens. And then when morality goes out the window in that empire, um, what happens is that they, this empire says, we don't want morality shoved down our throat. Don't give me this Torah thing. That's the Bible Thou shalt not murder. I don't want it. Get this out of here. Now, they can't kill the creator of the Torah of the Bible. They can kill the messenger, right? And if you kill FedEx, you don't get your package. And they come after the messenger. We are the messengers. We are the messengers of morality in this world. And that's not a racist kind of thing. I mean, where does the world know that it is immoral to murder or rape? Where does the world know that there's a concept called a weekend, right? It's all from the Torah. Okay, so if they don't want that morality, they come after the messenger. And then what happens? What happens next is, even sadder, what happens next is we say to that empire, hey, why are you hating on us? We're just like you. In fact, we're more Roman than you, Romans. We're more Greek than you. We are more liberal than the most liberal people in America, us Jews. We're just like you. And then they say, no, 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 no. You're not just like us. And let me show you that you're not just like us. We have a tool for that. It's called anti-Semitism. And then we know what happens next. Now, you know, it's the same script over and over again. And unfortunately, the next stage is, as you know, pogroms and extermination of Jews. Today, you know, we have there's only there's only one reason that that is not going to happen. And anybody who says never again, because, you know, Blinken or no one, no one's going to stop it except for Israel. So the only reason that's not going to happen today is LL.com. That's it. Let there be no mistake. And so, you know, Israel's here. So it's not going to be the same script over and over like it was throughout the generations. But the reality is that there is that deep hatred of us as the messengers of morality. And so they're blinded by that hatred and the logic goes out the window. And again, we're talking about some of the most intelligent people in the world. I mean, I'm not going to name names, but there's a very well-known investor in Silicon Valley who's, I would say, widely regarded as the top five tech investors in the world. I mean, really big name. He, he's he's not an anti-Zionist, and I think there's any difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism, but he doesn't even he doesn't even hide that it's that he's anti-Semitic. Just full-blown anti-Semitic, saying the most white Palestinian women, horrible, horrible things. This is an intelligent guy, very intelligent guy. It's like, what it, who are you and what do you do with this guy? When it comes to the hatred of Jews, truth goes out the window. And it's unfortunately been the case throughout our gener throughout the generations, throughout our history. But at the end of the day, as everyone knows, the Greeks are no longer. The Romans are no longer. The Egyptians are no longer. The Nazis are no, We are here. And that's going to be the case here. Hamas will be no longer. We will be here. We will win as we always do. 
Thanks for that, Hillel. I'm gonna, there's lots of questions coming in from our many participants. Uh, um, let me start with a question from the ZUA National Board Chair, Vice Chair Paul Tartel. What do you think should be done with Gaza after Hamas is defeated? And should Hezbollah be definitively addressed now? So, you know, again, I can give two answers here. I can give an answer as Hillel Fold. I can give an answer as a, let's call it a more, let's call it a political, whatever you analyst or whatever you call me online. I don't know what you want to call me. On a personal level, obviously, you know, I, I don't think there's any saving. I think, you know, Palestinian society from the ground up, starting from, you know, when they're indoctrinated in school, you know, there's no fixing that. That's just the reality. We have to work work with the future. Right now, I don't, you know, I don't on a personal level think there's any way uh, to, to kind of fix that society. From a more geopolitical, whatever you want to call it, you know, we did denazify Germany. We did, we have done this in Japan. We have done this before. There, there, there is precedent. Um, so, you know, I, I hope I hope we'll manage to do it. Uh, can I say I'm optimistic? No, um, but we don't have a choice. And as far as militarily speaking, you know, there are many options. And again, I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody, but you know, to me, it seems like the the best of all evils, you know, is is what we did in in Yehuda Shomron in, in Judea and Samaria, or what the world calls the West Bank, which is we have security control. They have their own towns, they have their own mayors, but you lift a gun and we're in there in Janine, or you're in there in Shen. Like, there's no. So the same thing. We we can give them again, putting aside for one second the fact that they're indoctrinated and 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 you know, we give them you know the ability to live, um, but we you know we have security control. It's not an ideal situation, but obviously neither is just taking over Gaza. It's a mess. There's no easy solution here. I think that that would probably be the most you know realistic uh, uh, solution to take security control of Gaza. As far as Hezbollah, um, yeah, it's uh, you know I, we say on Passover every every year we say it that our enemies they don't come at us one at a time, right? We say It's not just one; they're always coming at us together. The, the miracle, and my father says this every Passover, the miracle is that they don't unite. They fight each other, right? It's unbelievable. Pakistan and Iran, Iraq and Iran, and Hezbollah and Hamas. Like, if they would unite, I don't even want to think what would happen. But they go at each other, which is, to me, again, God pulling the strings. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Hezbollah, obviously, the the the, the uh, status quo of what's going on right now is highly unsustainable. Half of, you know, the North is evacuated. This can't continue. I understand that we want to try to avoid it diplomatically. And let's be honest, Hezbollah is a lot stronger than Hamas. So it's not great to go to war with Hezbollah. We're stronger. We'll defeat them. But for now, if you'd ask me on a personal level, I'd prefer to try to avoid another front right now with Hezbollah and figure out a, a way to, to solve this diplomatically for the time being. It's it's a it's a Band-Aid. I, no one thinks it's open heart surgery. It's a Band-Aid, but that's the best we've got right now. And on a, a couple of things, um, I, I do have hope as well that when you talked about denazification uh, after World War II, I think with with UNRWA um, gone, which I hope it will be soon, you can start to educate people outside of this world of terrorism uh, and the killing of Jews. I, I think we have great precedents uh, in both Germany and Japan for what happens after a, a situation like this. So I, I just want to agree historically that that makes a lot of sense. Well, one personal point is, um, as you know, hello, my my son started his service in the IDF in Sayyid Nachal. So thanks for the shout out to those folks. Um, uh, a question from Steve Feldman. Uh, what is your take on balancing the well-being of the captives versus long-term goals? And also the okay. bring them home versus free our captives. So but uh, on the first it's a, balance. It's a tough one. It's a really tough one. And I got to be honest. Um you know, I don't want to. I don't want to be like the spies in the Torah and speak badly about you know the, the land of Israel, the government of Israel. Um, but it's so typical. Defining objectives of a war that are mutually exclusive, you can't do both. If you're negotiating with Hamas to get our hostages back, then you're not destroying Hamas. And if you're destroying Hamas, then the hostages are dead. So these two objectives seem to have been uh, defined very like spontaneously without any strategy, you know, thought. But who knows? But the reality is that you know. I think the answer is that we need to speak their language, right? If we think, you know, appeasing them and listen, my brother's terrorist wasn't lacking anything in his life. He, he wasn't oppressed. He wasn't anything. He was living a good Western life and he had everything he wanted. And that that narrative of, oh, they're only attacking us because we're oppressing them or because of the occupation. I mean, again, this is just a perfect example of like, you know, you're a logical person. I'm speaking to a logical person. You're telling me that A, meaning the occupation causes B, right? A, occupation causes terror. Well, then, presumably, if you remove the occupation, meaning before the occupation, there should have been no terror. Well, 
we know that that's not the case. In fact, we know that there was Arab terror against Jews before the state of Israel. So what were they what were they committing terror for then? For the future occupation? It's ridiculous, right? So um, where was I going with this? Or what was the question? Balance. How do we balance between the right? Right. So, so the reality is, you know, I think we need to speak their language, and I think if there's any chance whatsoever of, and we're seeing it, we're seeing them surrender, you know, at, at mass in, in in Gaza right now. If there's any way we're going to get those hostages back, in my opinion, it's it's by strength. It's not by appeasing them. They they they. That's not what they need. And it's uh, the whole thing's one big false narrative of oh, poor Palestinians. Give me a break. Give me a break. That's not why they're attacking us. It never was why they're attacking us. And the funny thing about it, all, the, the, the most ironic thing, are that the Palestinians don't even play that game. Listen to them. Like, there's, no, there's never been a Palestinian leader ever that says, I'm going to live alongside Israel. What, what, what two-state solution? You're, you're dictating to them what they want when they say they don't want it? It's ridiculous. And it's the same people, by the way. That, here's the irony of it all. It's the same people who say that, you know, they don't mean it. When they say they want to kill, they don't mean it. Meaning they're not to be held accountable for their words because they're like little kids, you know, but those little kids deserve a state. Like, make up your mind. Are they a people or are they not a people? If they're a people, they need to be held accountable for the support of terror. If they're not, they're not a people, they don't deserve a state. Make up your mind. So I think if there's any chance of winning this war and getting our hostages back, it's, it's by strength and not by, you know, signing these insane suicidal deals that are being discussed right now that I pray and hope are not accurate. I agree. And I agree with Mort's take on that. Um, as the father of two Gen Z folks, one in the IDF, one here in the U.S., I uh, want to point out a question. How should we face the problem with Gen Z and Gen Alpha being overexposed to anti-Israel content? I want to say that that ZOA is putting together more and more of this content on our website, zoa.org. But Hillel, um, how should we address that? What are the explicit ways we can help Gen Z and Gen Alpha understand the truth, the facts, as you put it? Um, given how much they're being constantly exposed in social media to the negative views. Right. So on a personal level, I'll just kind of a, a, a confession, which is that I'm active on every social platform, but I've completely neglected TikTok because I just can't. I just can't. I mean, how do you talk to a Gen Zer who says that he supports Bin Laden? Like, what do you even say to a person like that? I have recently uh, reversed that policy and I have taken on TikTok recently, uh, hired someone to do it for me um, because we can't. We can't just abandon them. We can't. Now, again, you need to know where to use your resources. We're, we're not, we're all people with finite resources. And so I'm not going to spend five hours, uh, you know, a day talking to someone who believes that Bin Laden was a hero. Uh, don't even waste your breath, right? But I want to believe, I want to believe that there are people out there, even Gen Zers, who have been indoctrinated. It's nothing less than indoctrination, but are still listening. And it's hard to see. And I got to tell you something else. I think that, you know, as always, we see the extremists, right? The ones that are making noise, right? They're not the majority. They're not the majority. They're the ones, they're the loudest. They're the ones with the big bark. They're not biting. They're, they're, they're not even close to the majority. And I, and I don't even think it's true to say that the Gen Zers, it's true that there are many, you know, on TikTok and whatever, it's true. But I don't think that we need to reach any conclusions about Gen Z from the crazies that we see in libs of TikTok, you know, or or we see on TikTok. I mean, those are not the majority. Having said that, it's it's definitely a problem. I mean, you know, we're seeing, you know, forget forget TikTok. I mean, we're seeing it on campuses. We're, still, you know, I don't need to tell you. And so, it's a problem. It's it's a problem that I I don't have a clear solution for. I just think that we need to do what we've always done, which is stick to the truth, even when the truth is inconvenient. Meaning, when Israel messes up, own it, right? Own it. No lying. Uh, and unfortunately, too many people on our side have been caught doctoring videos, and that that you know that. That just destroys our whole case. Um, so we need to be very careful and stick to the truth. And I want to believe, as cliche as it might be, that truth will prevail eventually. Yeah, and I want to pick up just briefly before I get to some of the questions on on something that you mentioned in your opening. I was on a business call uh, um, right after the um, the explosion at the at Shifa Hospital, and um, uh, I was watching the back and forth, and people were on the call were also getting that, and I said. There is no way Israel did this. I knew that there was no conceivable way. And there was no way it could have been an accident either. There was no way Israel could have done this. I think keeping that in mind as you're watching all of this stuff churn, that the knowledge about the way Israel fights wars and the humanity with which we we, we fight wars, never, never let that um, far. Yeah, from and, and I'm just going to add one sentence, and that is that any military strategist who knows how wars are conducted is looking at the ratio between militant and, and civilian and that Israel, and it's, it's unheard of. This this war, mark my words, this is going to be studied 
in, in, in military strategy courses around the world for, for generations. What Israel has done here is unprecedented, unparalleled. And it's true that the crazies are saying genocide, but it's absolutely ridiculous. Zero basis. And what's, what we're doing here in terms of just surgical, it's, it's unprecedented. It's unbelievable to watch. The numbers are just absurd. The world has never known, you know, such morality in war ever. Yet somehow the posts are all about how how many civilian casualties there are. Lots and lots of questions coming in about uh, um, how to counter those. Um, I want to just based on what we're saying. Um, question from Lisa Albert. Uh, uh, lots of thanks for your for all the work that you do and how how comforting your posts have been and how important. The end of the question is: Have you considered at some point a book about this particular time in history, and your place in it, and how you've changed the narrative in this? Is that in the works? Um, should we be pre-ordering on Amazon? Um, so the truth is, I'm, I'm I'm working on several books right now. I haven't I have to find the time, which I don't know where I'll find. Uh, I haven't thought about writing a book about this, but who knows? I, I don't know. But you know, I, I just want to add one one thing, and and just I think this is a general um, piece of advice to anyone who's fighting the fight. You know, people don't listen to uh, people that are kind of dictating to them or monologue. No one wants to be sold anything, right? There's that famous. Uh, uh, Seinfeld scene where he gets a phone call from a telemarketer. He says, you know, give me your number. I'll call you back at home. He says, I think give me my number. He says, you don't want me calling you at home? Now you know how I feel, right? No one likes to be sold, right? And so when you're debating with someone, you could say, no, what you're saying is not true. It's a lie. You won't get anywhere. So I'm my style and what I believe is extremely effective, both online and offline, is asking. It's asking a question. So Israel killed 25,000 people. Okay, really? Oh, let's go with that. How many How many of those were, were terrorists? And they look at you like, uh, I don't know. Like you don't know because you're taking those figures from Hamas, and according to Hamas, everyone is innocent. So until you can tell me how many terrorists Israel's eliminated, let's stop quoting figures given to you by an actual terrorist organization. Just a, it, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. If you're going to quote those numbers, just tell me how many terrorists Israel killed. You know, it's so that that is something that I always do. I try to not dictate, but ask. Let's let's engage. Let's talk about this. You you want to say that you know Israel occupied a Palestinian state? Let's great. I'm I'm with you. Just kindly tell me who the prime minister was. Tell me what year it was established. Exactly. Just tell me. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not telling you anything. I'm asking. Tell me. And I, that that oftentimes does receive, uh, you know, the results that I'm hoping for. And I, um, as you were mentioning before, and we were talking about the historical precedents here with Germany and Japan, those are two extremely well-educated populations in the 1930s and the 40s. Still, the they, and especially in Germany, and I don't have to tell this to Mord, of course, um, but highly educated group, still um, toppled by anti-Semitism, believed it somehow, um, despite all of their knowledge and background. Of course, there was a history of anti-Semitism there, but how educated someone in doesn't necessarily comport with how anti-Semitic they are. Um, I have a question here from Eric Rosenberg. He wants to, first of all, thank uh, Morton Hillel. Um, the question is, can Israel? what can Israel do against Hezbollah and Iran when Europe and the US are led by appeasers and people that are manipulated by the Muslim Brotherhood? Um, you address a little bit of this, but how how do we do it? What do we do? So, so this is the kind of thing that I say to myself. I just I gotta throw my hands up and I gotta say this is beyond me. This is bigger than me because how do you you know we're talking about weeks weeks out they're gonna have a, they're gonna have a bomb in weeks they could have a bomb in weeks Iran I mean they're complete utter lunatics like there's no 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 debating that and so you know this is something that for me is extremely challenging and difficult on a daily basis I'm like. We're fighting this war, but we're really not fighting any. We're not fighting the actual. The actual enemy is Iran, and we're wasting our time with these little proxies, these little, you know, these little punks called Hamas. But in reality, we're not even dealing with the problem. So you know, it, it frustrates me. Uh, it angers me. Uh, I know we have the ability to prevent them from getting the bomb, and I want to believe that we will. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know how this plays out. You know, I I want to believe that America is going to realize that they just gave $6 billion to a bunch of lunatics who are going to destroy them. But, uh, you know, the, the the stupidity of, you know, politicians, not only in America, but also in America, just baffled, you know, it's staggering. So I, I, I don't have an answer to that question, sadly. I wish I did, but I, I I struggle with it every day. Literally, on a personal level, I'm like, what are we doing? Why are we not hitting the head of the snake? But that's when I turn to the one above and I say, just do what you got to do. I have a Question here um, from someone I know well, Hafsiba uh, Alon. Um, are you worried about the tech industry in Israel taking a hit due to BDS efforts? Uh, and are the universe also the universities in, in Israel? Uh, if, if this is a real concern for the Israeli economy, in your opinion, and this allows you to talk about both your yeah. your. 
So I'm not so BDS. That, that's not the issue. Uh, it's never been the issue. And you know, we've seen the the post of like go try boycotting Israel. I actually wrote a post about uh, from the river to the sea. I said let's play this out from the river to the sea. You wake up at seven o'clock in the morning. You turn on your phone, but it doesn't turn on because you tried to unlock it with Face ID that was developed by Prime Sense, an Israeli company that Apple acquired. So that doesn't work. You go out to your garden. You want to garden. You want to water your grass. That won't work because that's that's the technology developed by Israel, right? The whole you can't do anything. We don't, we, we've seen these posts. Uh, so BDS is not an issue. It's a joke, right? You see these BDS websites powered by Wix, right? It's it's a joke. Um, but the real question is, you know, how this war and just you know the last couple of years between Corona and you know the the um, judicial reform and the war, you know, we're taking a lot of hits. This country. Um, so you know, on a logical level, it's pretty scary. It is pretty scary. There's no question about it. Um, but if I'm taking a step back and looking at it the way I like to look at things, we're seeing absolute miracles. I mean, any any take any investor that's invested in Israel, he'll tell you that Israeli tech is over delivering, over delivering, which on the one hand is like, how does that make any sense? But on the other hand, again, look at our history, right? I'm going to say it again. Egypt, it literally says in the Torah, the more we were persecuted, the more we reproduced and the, more, the straight, stronger we got. Literally in the Torah, that is our nature. The more they terrorize, the more we innovate. That's what we've always done. And so we're seeing the fact that like whatever percentage of the workforce has been called up to be to reserves. So the other half is overcompensating. And we're seeing Israeli tech deliver and over deliver. And we're seeing, you know, massive companies, um, you know, Palantir and so many others, you know, making announcements that they're, that they're pouring money into Israel. Um, and so, you know, it's a scary time. There's no question about it. And obviously war is instability. And the last thing investors want is instability. I get it. But for now, and I believe that we're going to see Israel come out of the stronger because that's what we've always done. It is scary, though. There's no there's no, you know, denying that it's a scary situation. But for now, we're doing OK. And I believe we're going to continue to do OK. Excellent. Uh, as as some of you know, um, as all of you know, Israel is a startup nation. A number of people, many people have said that um, Hillel is responsible for making it scale up nation. So um, Hillel is, is the person that that carries that on. Um, Mort, any closing thoughts before um, we end in about seven minutes? Um, so I wanted to say, you mentioned how stupid is America giving them 16, giving the Iran $16 billion, eliminating sanctions. They're not stupid. I will say something sinister. This is, a, inten this is intentional by Obama, Valerie Jarrett and their cohorts to to give the power to Iran to destroy Israel and even the West. I think this is sinister and evil. Nothing else makes sense. Nobody's that stupid to give $16 billion to Arab Nazis like Iran. The only explanation is this is intentional because their motivation is something we don't even want to think about. That's all I want to say about it. Do you think yeah, I don't disagree? I was trying to be politically correct, but yeah. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> No need for political correctness here at the ZOA. Uh, um, uh, <laughs> last thing I'll do before I close, um, Jackie Schaefer, my colleague, um, is going to share a picture on screen. Um, uh, Mort mentioned at the beginning of this webinar uh, how important Ari Fold was to, to ZOA. Uh, here is a pin that we made um, for Ari. Uh, um, it you know it says to be a hero like Ari. I wanted to make sure that we saw this. Um, uh, it's hard to imagine a family that's done more for Israel than the folds. So I wanted if to. If I may, just add one sentence about Ari. Um, you know, Ari left many many legacies. I don't know if if everybody here is familiar. He, he chased the terrorist after he was stabbed in the main artery. He, he had no chance of survival. But in his last breath, he saved the woman. You know, and received the National Hero Award from the State of Israel. Uh, and he left many legacies. But I just want to maybe leave you with one of his legacies. For me, it's maybe the most important one, which is. Nobody should think that just, you know, just because they're one person that they can't change the world, that they can't impact millions of people. Ari, using a keyboard, impacted millions of people. I get messages till now, five and a half years later, people saying to me, literally, I converted because of Ari. I made Aliyah because of Ari. I keep Shabbos because of Ari. Like unbelievable things. He was one person. So, you know, if anybody here thinks that, oh, I'm just one person, I can't really have an impact, Ari has taught us otherwise. He has. Um, and I continue to see that in your feed and it's it's um it's heartening. Uh with five minutes left, um uh I'm gonna close here and I'm gonna read something. Um since the October 7th massacre, our work at ZOA has only become more challenging and more necessary. 
with students on campuses across the country, we're fighting a growing wave of anti-Semitism, as some of the questions I've talked about. Um, uh, we've doing that through our senior staff, through on-campus colleagues, through ZOA campus. I've personally been to a number of campuses over the past few weeks. The strain that Zionists are under, and a lot of the questions that we didn't have time to, and hopefully we can bring you back at some point, are about that, about um, how you, in your own personal online presence, how do you fight against those sorts of things? And how do you help your children deal? They, they still wanna have social lives if they're pro-Zionist on campus these days, it's very difficult. Um, ZOA continues to make sure that the media is held to task and their anti-Israel and anti-Semitic biases are challenged. Um, my colleagues at uh, ZOA Center for Law and Justice, the Office of Government Relations are at the forefront of those efforts. Um, we can only do this with your help, with all the people here and your friends. Please give generously to ZOA um, at our website, as we talked about, zoa.org, um, and click on Donate. Uh, Jackie will be sure to put those links when the when it's all um, uploaded onto YouTube. Um, we need your support in order to do this, to counteract online attacks and in-person attacks. Uh, um, thank you, Hillel. Thank you, Mort. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you to all the questions. Uh, um, Hillel, I'll give you the last two minutes uh, to talk about your, your summation of how you feel about where things are day to day, where things go in the future, just open floor for two minutes. So, I mean, I think, again, I want to leave you with this message, which is that, you know, we all feel hopeless, helpless at times, all of us, including myself. Um, but it is really important to remember something that I think is a very common misconception, which is, you know, I'm sure we've all heard it, but people say like, I'm going to post on social media. It's just my echo chamber. What's the point? Right, my friends. I'm preaching to the choir. I don't. What's the point? And I'm here to tell you that that is just fundamentally wrong. There's no other way to say it. And and it's it's a common misconception because the way social media works. I don't think I need to tell you this is if you share something that's impactful and meaningful, one person shares it, you've just exited your your echo chamber. You now reach that person's friends, right? So when I tweet something and I get retweeted by the craziest people in a good way. And I've completely exited my echo chamber. And so each and every one of us has a keyboard. And so I just want to say that, you know, we are all deeply, deeply devastated. We're all in mourning. And it is really, really hard to get up and, and act. And, but, you know, our instinct is just to scroll our social media feeds like, like drug addicts, right? We can't do that. We can't do that. Each and every one of us has a job and an ability to impact people. And so whether it's on social media, whether it's comforting a friend, whatever it is, we, we all need to do this. Is, this is a group effort. This is a this is a nationwide effort, the Jewish people. And I, I'll leave you with one last thought that I heard from a friend that really just to me was the most beautiful thing I've heard this entire war. He said that in the portion of Lech Lecha, God tells Abraham to leave his home and go to this strange land we call Israel. Um, there are four words that God says to Abraham that I learned my entire life, never paid attention to them. My entire life, I learned these words, never paid attention to them. The words are, and I'll say it in Hebrew, and then I'll translate, God says to Abraham, those who bless you, Abraham, aka the Jewish people, will be blessed. Those who curse you. Now, you don't have to be a grammar geek to understand that the next word should parallel. It should, it's, those who bless you will be blessed. Same word, bracha, blessing. But then it says, umekalelcha, those who curse you, it should have said, akalel, I'll curse. But it doesn't. It changes language. It says, aor, which is another way to say, I'll curse. But the obvious question is, why does the Torah switch languages? It's just not parallel. And so I heard from Rav Ephraim Goldberg from Boca Raton. He said, the word aor has another word in it, or light. He said, this is the right way to read that verse in the Torah. Those who stand with you, the Jewish people, will be blessed. Those who get in your face, those who stand in your way in this dark hour, they'll see your light. They'll see your unity. They'll see your charity. They'll see ZOA. They'll see the amazing things that the nation is doing and how we're unifying and how 300,000 people marched in Washington and 300,000 reservists went to, went to war. That's 600,000 people. When was the last time we had 600,000 people unified? It was at Mount Sinai when we received the Torah, when we were born as a nation, uh, uh, because uh. our unity is our strength. And we are seeing unprecedented unity in the Jewish people right now. Those who stand with us will be blessed. Those who curse us will see our light. And that is what the world is seeing. Our enemies bring darkness. 
we are going to extinguish their darkness with our light. That's what we've done. That's what we're doing. And that's what we're going to continue to do. And that is why we will dance again. Thank you, Hillel. And thank Hello. you. The I many went, people. Oh, go ahead, Mark. I can interrupt you. Forgive me. There's one question that's been bothering me. I'm going to take the liberty to ask it of you as a high-tech professional. How are we to understand, as you mentioned yourself in your little, in your important talk, that high-tech professionals who are rational people, highly intelligent people, very smart people, analytical people, why are they almost all such left-wing liberals and not right-of-center conservatives? Why are there Zuckerbergs and Gates left-wing and the rest of them, and even the person you mentioned who's so hostile to Jews? How are we to understand that people who are otherwise analytically smart make no sense whatsoever when it comes to these uh, political thoughts and thoughts about Israel and, and, and the Jews? You know, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Of course, there are people that are evil. I'm not, I'm not even going to talk about those people. Evil is something else. But, you know, thousands of my friends literally are super left wing, right, in the tech world. Um, and I, I want to believe that it comes from a place of hope, optimism, maybe even compassion, which we are compassionate people. And the thought that you cannot make peace with someone we understand it because we open history books and we understand, you know, ideologies and we understand. But when someone, you know, is brought up in a secular, you know, peace loving. And again, I think I think I want to believe that many of these people lean left because they they're naive. They, they think they can't accept that there is a, a concept of millions of people who are indoctrinated to kill you irrelevant of how much you love them. I mean, you know, we know that, that you know, October 7th, there was all, so many peace, you know, people who dedicate their lives to peace activism, you know, we know what happened. You know, I don't, I don't, it's, I don't want to, that's it's kind of too soon to talk about that, but we don't know the Holocaust. I mean, you know, like we were assimilated and we were always assimilated. And so we have to realize that it's, you know, we take our values and here's, here's the fundamental problem. We take our values in the West and we think that, you know, they apply to radical Islam. If I treat someone with dignity and respect, they're going to reciprocate, right? Well, yeah, in the Western world, among civilized, normal people, but not in radical Islam. That is not a value that they share. And so when I'm, without, you know, looking through a historical or a religious lens, I can understand why a person would say, I do not accept that these people will not make peace with us. I do not, let's give them what they want. Let's keep giving them. But you're like, but we gave them. Gaza, look what happened. Let's give them more. So we, we understand that that's... You know, what did, I think it was Einstein said, you, you repeat the same thing and you expect a different result. You're an idiot, right? Or whatever he said, fool. Um, but, you know, these people, they they want peace so badly. And that's a beautiful thing because we're, we're, we are a religion of peace, unlike the other religion that says they're a religion of peace. We are actually a religion of peace, you know? And so we want peace. We want compassion. We want, but we have to understand that, like anything in life, if you do anything, you know, without moderation, it turns bad. And we know in Jewish scripture, if you have, you know, compassion for the evil, you end up being evil to the compassionate. And so that's that's the reality. They, I think many of them come from a place of compassion uh -huh. and they're uh -huh. naive and they want peace. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Thank you, Hillel, for bringing that all together. Um, and again, if you want to support us in our work, coa.org, there'll be a link uh, in the YouTube video when it's posted. Thanks to everyone. Sorry we didn't get to your questions. Uh, reach out. My email address will also be linked uh, in the YouTube video. Happy to respond to questions and we will continue to produce content related to this kind of content more and more as we go forward. Thanks everyone. Thank